a videographer is hired by a wannabe Rambo to film him kicking ass and taking names. But as real bullets start flying, a question arises immediately. Is this a commercial or is this some kind of real murder on tape? Something akin to a snuff film. What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listen in the dark. It's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my spookies. It's Wednesday, and you know what that means. It's time for a little spooky in your weekly. I'm your host and narrator, Enrique Kuto, and you may have noticed I have a bit more bass in my voice this week. Well, I didn't change microphones, but I did have a little bout with COVID. So I am in the midst of recovering from my illness, but I'm well enough to bring you a terrifying tale by David O'Hanlon tonight. So don't worry, my friends, your spooky is right on schedule. And then I'll be taking a very well-earned nap, believe you me. But don't worry, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm over it pretty much all the way. Just a little remaining congestion. But enough about me. I want to say a big thank you to all of you, not only for listening, but for supporting the program, whether it's by leaving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or heading to weeklyspooky.com and clicking on Patreon and paying as little as $1 a month to get bonus content every other week. That's right. For as little as $1 a month on Patreon, you get two bonus shows every single month. And right now, they're parts of a 12-part series called The Weekend by Rob Fields about a group of campers who are spending their weekend on a abandoned campground. And as you can guess, it doesn't go great. (laughs) Or, well, it goes really well. It goes awesome for us listening. It's a wild ride, a lot of fun, and available exclusively at weeklyspooky.com when you click on Patreon. But now, my friends, before I take my nap, I have quite a fearful tale. This one is sick, depraved, violent, gory, all the things that make life worth living or worth dying, depending on how you look at it. And we'll get to that right after these quick words. Gamble with the Devil by David O'Hanlon Travis Gamble crumpled the rejection letter and tossed it into the trash on his way into the kitchen. It was the third one for the month. It frustrated him, but it wasn't the end of the world. Travis didn't need to work, after all. His family made armaments for the military. Desert Storm had inflated their net worth by hundreds of millions two years prior. Gamble didn't want to build weapons, however. He was a weapon. Every day went exactly the same. Two scoops of ultimate orange to get him going. The ephedrine made his teeth grind and his ears hot, so he knew it was working. Then an hour on the total gym before breakfast. His diet never changed, nor did it need to. He'd structured his meals perfectly and followed each with beef liver tablets and amino acids. After the first meal of the day, he read from his collection of military manuals for two hours, then practiced martial arts. None of that strip mall taekwondo bullshit either. He was a student of the Dance of Death, an expert in dim mock, and he'd trained with ninja masters throughout the Midwest. After lunch, he did firearms training in the kill house he'd built, followed by a five-mile run around the property. After a well-earned shower, Gamble spent his evenings looking for work. It seemed like every week a new mercenary outfit opened its doors, and none of them wanted to hire Travis. He took some odd jobs out of various classifieds, but the have-gun-will-travel shtick was getting old. 
He wanted real action, and he was about to get it. An increasing number of lawsuits were making it difficult for magazines to advertise his kind of work. But the internet was quickly finding its way into every home in America. The message boards were full of opportunities, but he needed to get his name out there. He applied for three outfits in Somalia and another working the Balkans before nodding off in the Lazy Boy with the latest issue of Gung Ho in his lap. A quarter past midnight, the overly excited salesman on TV woke him. Gamble watched the wiry little man with the push-broom mustache excitedly ramble on about the cheap junk he was hawking. That's when it hit him. Travis needed a commercial. Enter Ernest Valiant. Ernie had a certificate of completion from an advertising correspondence course, a big dream, and a bunch of video equipment he'd be paying on for the next decade if he didn't start finding gigs. His day job as assistant manager of the Empornium almost paid his rent. Almost wasn't good enough for his landlord, unfortunately, so when some gun nut offered him 20 grand to shoot a two-minute commercial, Ernie did what anyone would do. He lied his ass off to make sure he got the job. His 78 Monza wagon clanked and groaned up the gravel path to Gamble's compound, and he pulled in front of the house. It was a strange structure that somehow managed to find synergy between feudal Japan and Memphis trailer park chic. Ernie kept his hand on the shifter, debating whether or not Gamble was an eccentric rich kid playing soldier or just another nut job with a manifesto. The size of the property told him that however it shook out, the check would still clear. He put the wagon in park. Ernie stepped out into the heat and humidity that seemed intent on sticking around, despite it being the first week of fall. Music from behind the redneck pagoda told him where he'd find his benefactor. He listened for a moment, trying to place the song. What kind of soldier of fortune listens to Prince? he wondered. Ernie shook it off and grabbed the JVC video camera from its case to look as professional as possible when he rounded the house. Ernie's shoulders sagged at what he saw. It was like watching the training montage in one of those shitty blood fist sequels. Gamble occupied the center of a training platform surrounded by fixtures holding wooden boards and stacks of bricks. He fired off blows in the air with loud, Tiaz! in silk pants emblazoned with tigers on both sides. Once he finished the kata, Gamble bowed to an imagined sensei and launched into a furious chain of attacks that left splintered lumber and crushed masonry in his wake. Maybe the commercial is for Home Depot, Ernie thought with a quiet chuckle. Gamble bowed again and stepped down from the platform. You must be Ernesto, he said, pulling a drenched sweatband from his high forehead. Somehow, his Swayze-level mullet was still pristine. I wasn't expecting you so early. I drive with a heavy foot, I guess. Ernie tried not to roll his eyes at the obvious bullshit. He gestured at the former construction materials. I guess this is just a regular part of your day, then. Of course, Travis assured him. Every part of my body is an instrument of death. Taking a piss must be pretty intense, Ernie chuckled, but cleared his throat and regained his composure. So, um, you think you could do that again? You said you were looking for a lot of action shots for the ad, and that was, well, it was pretty action-packed. That was nothing, Travis waved it off. No, Ernesto, you're going to be shooting real action. We'll get some B-roll today, of course. Some of the training drills I use to keep myself highly dangerous. Some workout shots to show off my bod. Maybe a dim mock demonstration, too. That one come with a special sauce? Ernie bit his lip. It's the death touch, Gamble said matter-of-factly. I can hit a man in the chest and rupture his cerebellum. It's about chi flow and utilizing the body's meridians to manifest an immediate, fatal result. Sounds cool, Ernie nodded. How about we manifest you a commercial? And they did. Ernie filmed Gamble throwing ninja stars, doing push-ups, shooting mannequins, and breaking bricks for the remainder of the day. Whenever it was time to switch tapes or batteries, Travis had him record audio for possible voiceovers, 
where he blathered about warrior cultures, recited macho one-liners, and waxed poetic about the distinguished history of the mercenary profession. When they were finished, Travis insisted on them having dinner together, despite Ernie claiming every possible food allergy to get out of it. Gamble brought out the MRE rations and let his guest choose the entree. Ernie perused the shelf as he scooped what the package identified as beef stroganoff from the pouch with his plastic fork. "'You've read all these?' Ernie asked. "'Most of them,' Gamble said. "'I'm still working my way through a poor man's James Bond series, but I've committed the anarchist cookbook to memory. The same with The Art of War, Machiavelli's The Prince, and The Book of Five Rings.' I read one of the military training manuals every day. They're a bit too technical for recreational reading, but are an imperative part of my mission to be the world's greatest mercenary. Right. Ernie dropped the utensil into the ration pouch. I'd say you're off to a good start. I'll go through what we shot and get you something this week that really captures your... uh... energy and badassness. Oh, but that was just the filler. We haven't gotten to the good stuff yet. You know, the real meat and potatoes of what I'm doing. Hopefully those don't come in another of these pouches, Ernie scowled. He was sure he'd earned his paycheck after spending the day on the set of Enter the Douchebag. There was more than enough material to convince people he could intimidate their ex-wives or beat up the neighborhood bully or whatever the fuck kind of work Gamble thought a highlight reel would drum up. We still have to shoot the action scenes, Travis told him. The karate wasn't the action? Ninjutsu, Travis corrected him. No, the action has to be authentic. It can't be training footage or stage fights. You are going to accompany me on a genuine assault of a terrorist compound. Yeah, um, sorry to tell you this now, but I don't have a passport. Ernie shook his head. Besides, I have other clients this week, so I can't... You'll be home in time for Frosted Flakes, Travis interrupted with a smile. He hadn't done that all day. Ernie wished he hadn't then, either. The expression made his skin prickle and his balls shrink up tight to his body. Gamble stalked across the living room and took the pouch from Ernie's hand with a delicate, almost lover-like movement. The smile grew wider. He pressed a finger to Ernie's lips as they started wriggling into an objection. I have something special for you to wear, he told the cameraman. The hour-long drive through the Tennessee backwoods was filled with awkward silence. The men wore matching flak jackets, though Gamble wore his over his bare torso, and camo stripes adorned his face and lean, muscular arms. He'd given Ernie a Kevlar helmet to match the body armor, but the would-be Merc didn't bother protecting his own head. It probably wasn't necessary anyhow, and it would have deprived him of the opportunity to be a stereotype while he tightened his headband around his brow like Rambo. Gamble had given Ernie little more information on their mission, only that there was a threat to the American way of life looming in the sticks southwest of Nashville. Ernie wasn't entirely convinced the story wasn't part of some kinky sex murder thing when they finally came to a stop. Sure, he hadn't been tied up, and he did have the surplus armor, but maybe it was all part of Gamble's strange fetish. Maybe the mercenary wanted them to go out into the woods and jump into each other's foxholes before killing Ernie in a friendly fire fantasy. That seemed to be the case when Travis opened the glove box. Ernie swallowed hard at the sight of the cold, blue steel within. Take that, just in case, the Merc said. Ernie slid the revolver out of the compartment and checked to see if it was loaded. It was. That made the game a bit stranger. Ernie angled the barrel towards Gamble under his arm just in case it was all a ruse. Why, why are we way out here, he muttered. I told you. We're defending freedom and kicking ass. Gamble took a swig of ultimate orange from a travel mug before continuing. St. Dymphna's Youth Asylum is three clicks through the woods. And it's full of terrorists? Ernie shook his head vigorously. I'm here to film a commercial. Call the FBI or something. Why? Gamble got out of the truck, 
Ernie hesitantly followed him. The meager spray of moonlight coming through the trees made Gamble look like a mirage as he moved to the tailgate. Calm down, Ernesto. They're not actual terrorists, Gamble assured him. They're just devil worshippers. It was either this or crash a drug lab. The second one might seem undemocratic of us. Free market capitalism is the anchor that keeps America in the harbor of freedom, after all. So we're going after the Satanists. Easy peasy. Chances are they won't even be armed. It'll be a walk in the park. Have you walked through a fucking park lately? Ernie's voice cracked and he brought it back down to a whisper. People get murdered in parks. You're one guy. The police send in entire SWAT teams for things like this. And what the fuck do you mean chances are? Didn't you do some kind of recon or whatever it's called? We don't need a SWAT team. I'm better trained than those pussies. He unsnapped a plastic case. Plus, we have Sally. Who's Sally? Gamble held up the rifle. It looked like something out of a sci-fi movie. He inserted a magazine and pulled back the charging handle. Sally is my babe. A Ruger Mini 14 bullpup conversion with laser sighting and modified for full auto. She goes from siesta to fiesta with two pounds of trigger pressure. Each magazine is 30 rounds of mercury-tipped boat tail hollow points that explode on impact and will turn this black mass into a Bielsa bloodbath. That, okay, yeah, so that was actually pretty clever, Ernie begrudgingly admitted. But that's one gun against an entire colt. I have another. Gamble pulled an obscenely long piece of overcompensation from the high-mounted holster on his right leg. This is my mistress. She's a... Save me the guns and ammo review, Gamble. I could get killed. Ernie pointed at the mercenary's waist. Are those... fucking nunchucks? Of course. Gamble holstered his pistol and removed a sword from his case. He pointed it at Ernie. We want the video to show off as many of my skills as possible. You're not filming a commercial. You're making a goddamn snuff film. Don't be ridiculous, Ernesto. He sheathed the sword across his back. It's only a snuff film if someone jerks off to it. People jerk off to everything. You know what the most rented movie at the Emporium was last month? Miss Piggy does Houston. Have you ever seen a Muppet getting butt-fucked by a grown man? Not since I rented the movie. Travis snickered and slapped Ernie on the shoulder. I'm fucking with you, man. Beating it lowers your testosterone. That's probably why you have man boobs, by the way. Grab your camera, Kermit. It's time to take Piggy out dancing. Don't go away. Weekly Spooky will be right back. The night vision filter on the camera cast the structure in various shades of green and black. Vines and graffiti gave life to the drab, battered facade of the two-story asylum. The architecture itself was as exciting as a Lego brick. Bars sat over broken window panes, and a pair of heavy wooden doors stood wide open and half off their hinges. Headstones of pauper graves stood among knee-high grass along the western side of the building. Ernie panned the camera there and spotted only the occasional blur of movement as Travis Gamble closed in on the target through the cemetery. He actually looked like he knew what he was doing. Ernie redirected the camera to the hospital. Flickering light danced from some of the upstairs windows. Shadows fluttered on the walls, breaking up the verdant video feed with obsidian specters. Ernie fought back a nervous gag. Two people came around one side of the building in a lazy curve that skirted the boneyard. Ernie zoomed the camera in for a closer look. They wore matching outfits with sheepskin chaps and open robes. The camera was zoomed to its max, and the details of the medallions hanging around their necks were lost in the low resolution. Something flashed in the moonlight, and spurts of black liquid gushed from one man's neck. Gamble sprang from the tall grass and launched himself in a flying kick that dropped the other. Gamble drew his sword, striking a pose with it before thrusting the blade into the prone guard. He pivoted to find the first man still stumbling. The spurting had lost its intensity. Gamble swung the sword, and the man's torso separated from his legs. Ernie spewed Stroganoff into the bushes. He'd have to edit that out of the footage later. 
if he survived and escaped a prison sentence. Gamble waved for him to come. The cameraman wiped his mouth on the back of his hand and debated running back to the truck. Static crackled in his ear. Come on, Ernesto. Get some close-ups of these two before we go inside, Gamble said over the radio. This sword is ridiculously sharp. Did you see how it cleaved that D&D geek in half? He'd seen it, and thanks to the reminder, vomited once more before responding that he was on his way. By the time he arrived, Gamble had taken position at the corner of the building to make his next move. Ernie dutifully filmed the corpses. Bubbles rose and popped from one of the victim's lips. Is this guy still alive? If he is, I want my money back for the sword, Gamble said with a quick glance back. I stabbed him in the brain, doofus. He's not alive. The bubble thing is air leaving his lungs since he's no longer using them. Oh, come on, the next part is going to happen pretty fast, Gamble said. It's all happening pretty fast, Ernie thought. The two men made their way along the front of the asylum. The mercenary made a show of checking the doorway before rolling through and sweeping the room with the barrel of his rifle. He gave a series of hand signals that hadn't been part of Ernie's limited briefing. Gamble sighed. Come inside, he hissed. Ernie did so. He filmed the dilapidated interior. Pentagrams, 666s, upside-down crosses, and the rest of the satanic regalia peddled by Hollywood had been spray-painted wherever there wasn't a fist hole or a thick patch of black mold to obscure the canvas. Gamble started up an L-shaped stairway while Ernie took some quick establishing shots. Hey! A voice called out. Who the fuck are you, dickweed? Ernie froze in place. I'm talking to you, Jizzstain. This is for black lambs only. What are you doing here? The gruff voice demanded. Mostly trying not to shit myself at the moment, Ernie muttered. He turned slowly. The man came closer, passing by a barrel of bursting detritus that cast a hellfire glow across the goat skull he'd fashioned into a mask. Ritual scars adorned his dark, bare chest. His hand moved to the grip of a dagger. I asked who the fuck you are, he growled. I'm, I mean, um, I'm with ABC. ABC? The guard stopped walking and drew the blade from its sheath. That stands for about to be castrated? God, I hope not. Ernie's free hand covered his crotch. We're doing a piece on religious freedom in America. I didn't realize you guys were having a meeting tonight. I'll come back later. Only in a seance, dickweed. The man charged. Ernie aimed the camera at him, hoping his last moments would at least look cool if anyone ever found the footage. Then the killer grunted and toppled forward. The animal skull shattered, spreading bone like confetti across the dingy tile floor. Ernie moved the camera down, since looking at the carnage through the lens was easier on his stomach. Over half of the throwing star had buried itself into the cultist's brainstem. Smart thinking not using the gun I gave you. Gamble said over the radio and waved him to follow upstairs. Yeah, I thought that was the best play, Ernie lied. He'd forgotten all about the magnum stuffed into his waistband. He wouldn't next time. Ernie stepped around yet another dead body, wondering if Gamble might actually be the bad motherfucker he presented himself to be before jogging up the stairs as quickly as possible. Gamble stayed close to the wall as he stalked down the hallway with Sally pressed tight into his shoulder. Ernie tried to copy the movement, but it ruined his shot and his sense of professionalism overrode his sense of self-preservation. He stepped into the center of the hall for the best angle on the mercenary. Candles, some of them scented, burned along the sides, providing only enough light to avoid tripping over scattered debris and refuse. Obscene chanting in a malevolent tongue carried from one of the rooms further along the path. A masculine, deep voice bellowed arcane words of power that crackled with artificial amplification. The revelry of the worshippers gained fervor. There were other sounds, closer, but not as scary. Gasps, moans, squeals. Ernie's mind pushed them away and focused on the nefarious chanting. Gamble paused and peeked around an empty door jam. He ducked back, holding up a clenched fist that Ernie assumed meant stop. 
Gamble signaled for silence and then pointed at the room. Ernie stepped cautiously as he maneuvered for a shot of whatever was waiting inside. His stomach pitched, but there was nothing left to throw up. Dozens of mutilated goats hung from the ceiling, some sacrificed so recently that the muscles still twitched and made them dance on their hooks. Guts dangled from their split torsos and trickled blood like broken faucets. Ernie followed a long rope of entrails with his camera down onto the occupants of the room. On a collection of mildewed mattresses and in puddles of spilled sacrificial offal, the cultists, wearing nothing but their woolen chaps, fucked in every conceivable position. Bloody skin slapped together and peeled apart again and again. A woman chewed at a length of intestine to muffle her orgasmic shrieking. Two of the men interlocked their hands in a mystic form as they thrust themselves into a third from opposite ends. A gory blonde held herself up by the ribcage of one of the animals while three mouths went to work on different erogenous zones. Nothing at the Emporium compared to what Ernie was filming. He stole a glance around the hall but kept the camera on the action. He was sure they couldn't see him recording, or his own cock straining against the fabric of his khakis. The blonde shuddered and squealed, then seemed to stare straight into Ernie's eyes. Not my eyes, he realized. The blinking red recording light reflected off the fractured window behind her. Ernie moved his hand to the butt of the revolver. If she alerted the others, he was as good as dead. It was self-defense, but that didn't make it easier to wrap his mind around. He didn't want to kill anyone. He wasn't sure if he could, despite how easy Gamble made it look. Speaking of, the mercenary slid something from a pouch on his body armor. Ernie turned to get a better look at the cylindrical device through the night vision. The lens flashed with a sudden flare, and then sparks shimmered and fell like iridescent snowflakes from the top. Ernie's mind flashed back to the bookshelf at Gamble's place, to the black cookbook with the white letters on the spine. Gamble chucked the device into the room, then gestured frantically for Ernie to move. The camera went from the sparkling fuse to the confused faces of the orgy-goers that noticed. Most kept on fucking, oblivious to the incendiary intrusion. Orgasms built around the room. Ernie scanned the crowd. The blonde was trying to warn the others but stammered the words as her lovers continued biting, licking, and sucking at her flesh. Ernie couldn't make his feet move. He wanted to shout for everybody to run, but he only managed to lick his lips in anticipation. The swelling in his pants grew until it hurt. Lustful screams rose as the fuse shortened. Ernie dived away at the last second. The bomb exploded, and so did he. When the ringing left, he could hear that the room was still full of screams, just not the pleasurable kind. Ernie huffed in post-orgasmic exhaustion. Shame, fear, guilt, embarrassment, and lingering arousal all swirled around in his skull like a witch's brew. He pulled himself into a fetal position as Gamble stepped into the doorway and opened fire on the survivors. Ernie forced himself onto his back to keep filming. The other cultists had stopped chanting and were storming the hallway. Gamble had greatly underestimated their numbers, but luckily not their armament. The Merc changed magazines and Sally sang like Streisand in his fists. Baseball-sized holes opened in rampaging bodies. Heads exploded, limbs and bits of ceremonial garb flew into the air. Another nail bomb slid down the corridor. Gamble fired from the hip as he strafed the Satanists with gunfire. The bomb went off, throwing corpses and pieces of them in all directions. Gamble let Sally hang from her sling as he helped Ernie to his feet. I sure hope you got all that on tape, he said. Uh Uh-huh, Ernie managed to squeak out. He was more concerned with hiding the stain spreading down his leg. I got it all right. Let's see what they were up to, Gamble suggested as he started through the smoldering sea of carnage. Nails stuck out of charred flesh and the smell of burnt wool hung heavy in the air. Gamble's pistol boomed as he delivered his own sort of mercy to a still groaning victim. He guided Ernie to the last door on the left and swung inside with the hand cannon ready. Ernie whimpered. 
It wasn't nearly as pleasant as the previous room. The symbols painted on the walls of the room were much more intricate and well-crafted than the crude graffiti he'd seen upon entry to the asylum. This room wasn't for amateurs. He tried to blink away pulling tears as he took it all in. Are you afraid? Good. Weekly Spooky will be right back. Four hospital gurneys were lined up inside a circle of black candles. Each had a person strapped to it, and blood poured over the sides of three of them before disappearing down a floor drain. Ernie filmed the bodies first. Each was young, mid-teens at the latest, with their chests torn open and their hearts burning inside. The pungent scent of incense rose from the low, green flames engulfing the organs. A powerfully built man in heavy, vermilion robes stood stoically over the only survivor. The skull of a bighorn ram hid his face as he moved his glance from Gamble to Ernie. A prepubescent girl squirmed against her restraints before him. You should leave, the priest said, slipping the mask off and letting it shatter on the floor. The ritual is for the eyes of the faithful alone. The ritual's been canceled, pal. Gamble leveled his pistol at the man's chest. On the bright side, you're about to meet the devil in person. I already have, you fool. The priest raised a double-bladed sacrificial knife. You must leave while there's still time. This must end tonight. We must undo what... The gunshot boomed and echoed through the shower room. The priest's brain splattered the wall behind him. He stumbled back and forth, his eyes rolled up and crossed in an attempt to see the puckered hole in his forehead. Gray matter slithered down the tile walls like slugs. The priest collapsed on top of the struggling child and they slumped away in a heap. Ernie lowered the magnum smoking barrel and let the gun clatter to the floor. God damn it, Ernesto! Gamble jammed his own pistol into his holster. I was supposed to kill him. He looked at the camera, still trained on the gore-spattered wall. He raised an eyebrow and nodded appreciatively. Wow, you made that shot without taking the camera off the guy? He said with bemusement. Maybe with some creative editing, I can still take credit for it. For the sake of the commercial, I mean. But damn, man, you are a natural at this sort of thing. If we get you in shape and work on that vomiting problem you have, you could make a damn good mercenary yourself. I don't want to be a fucking mercenary, Ernie screamed. I just want to go back to my shitty fucking apartment, cry in my scuzzy shower, and think happy fucking thoughts. Happy thoughts? The little girl said. She giggled melodically. Happy thoughts, happy thoughts. There's you a happy thought, Ernesto. Gamble moved to the gurney and started undoing the child's restraints. You rescued a little girl from a sick asshole. Sure, I did most of the work, but you played a crucial role in the operation. Is that thought happy enough for you? Those aren't the thoughts that make Ernie happy, the girl said in her sweet, dainty voice. Sarah is Ernie's happy thought. Who's Sarah? Your girlfriend? Gamble asked. Do you know the Rugrat? Ernie shook his head in equal confusion. That was her name, the blonde that looked you in the eyes, the sacrificial child explained. The one you didn't try to warn, the one you were thinking about when the bomb went off, the one that made you come like a virgin in a stiff breeze. She's your happy thought, not the way she was then, but the way she is now. Uh, I think, I think she's talking to you, Ernie stammered. No! The gravelly, malevolent voice boomed from the child's mouth. Her voice returned to its previous delicate playfulness as she continued. I know you, Ernie. You can't wait to get home and watch the footage. You want to touch yourself. To stroke your anorexic cock while you picture Sarah's smoldering flesh and the ravaged stumps that used to be her legs pressing on the sides of your head while you lap at her ruptured gut. That's pretty sick, man, Gamble said with a disapproving glance at Ernie. I don't know what she's talking about. She's... she's fucking traumatized or something. Oh, please, 
She giggled and sat up suddenly, snapping the remaining strap around her shoulders with ease. An innocent smile formed on her tiny face. I know all about the secret collection of videos, the ones you rent out to special customers. The ones you make at your cousin's mortuary with that adorable little gimp mask on to hide your shame. She rolled off the gurney, kneeling next to the priest. Gamble jumped clear and reached instinctively for his pistol. The girl lifted the dead man's head. You like corpses, but you've never gotten to see one being made before, she continued. You've never had access to ones as fresh as these tonight. The girl shoved her fist into the back of the priest's skull and wiggled her finger out of the entrance wound. She laughed and looked up at Gamble. What do you think, Travis? It might be a bit of a tight fit, but I bet our pal Ernie could have the time of his life with this one. Listen, kid, Gamble started. Kid? The child looked down at her floral dress and frilled socks. Oh, yes. The little ones are so much easier to bargain with. Promise them an ice cream, throw a kitten in, and they'll invite any old soul in for a stay. The child blinked away her blue eyes and replaced them with red, pupilless orbs. What in the hell? Travis stumbled back and whipped his pistol from the holster. Yes. Hell indeed. The child's voice deepened again. She stood pulling off the priest's head with ease and bowling it across the floor. She pranced between two of the occupied gurneys and sighed. It's a shame you didn't get here sooner to save the others. We haven't had a boy's night out since Luden. I suppose I could burn down a convent in their honor. That would do nicely, don't you think? Ernie knelt to retrieve the revolver when the gurneys flew across the room and smashed the tilted walls into shards. The child held up a finger and wiggled it disapprovingly. Her back rippled with movement beneath her skin. An alarm clock chimed in the corner. The girl snapped her fingers, and it exploded. Its little brass bell pinged off Ernie's helmet. The child levitated from the floor. Time's up. Warranties expired. Trial period over, she growled. No refunds, no returns, and no fucking exchanges. Here's a lesson you won't live long enough to need, Travis. Never summon what you can't put back. Gamble raised the pistol. The metal fissured and the weapon fell to pieces in his hand. The girl floated around him and laughed demonically. You wanted to go to war, Travis. So, allow me to oblige. First, we'll need an army. The child clapped her hands, and groans filled the corridors of the asylum. The floor shook and fractured. Asbestos fell from the trembling ceiling. Ernie looked over his shoulder and screamed. He stumbled further into the room, making way for the shambling cadavers filing through the doorway. Dismembered bodies crawled and hobbled while disembodied appendages slithered like caterpillars into the room. More moans emanated from outside. Rotting children scaled the building, shaking off their dirt of their graves as they clawed their way through the crumbling walls. Sarah's buxom torso with her bloodied blonde hair hanging from her mangled scalp scurried across the room on ragged, nail-studded stumps. Ernie shrieked in horror as the reanimated victims of the asylum and Gamble's own perverse roleplay converged on the mercenary. Gamble swung his nunchakus at them wildly. The wood thudded against the flesh and cracked bones, but the assault didn't stop. Sarah rushed through the fracas and clamped her teeth down on Gamble's crotch. His high-pitched screech disappeared in a cacophony of chewing and tearing as he was swallowed by the mass of the necromantic mob. Ernie staggered to the wall and slid down, unable to take his eyes off the scene as he had been with the orgy. That's what this is, he told himself. This is another orgy. Flesh on flesh, mouths on flesh, penetration, bodily fluids mingling, exchanging. He didn't want to admit it, but it had the same stiffening effect on him as before. The demon was right. He liked the dead. He liked the way cold skin felt on his warm lips and the way it held him when he slipped inside. He crawled across the floor tentatively. Gamble was crying under the heap of undulating meat and viscera. Ernie crawled faster. He sprang into the dog pile. 
guts squished between his fingers as he buried himself in the carnage. Sarah chewed viciously at Gamble's thigh, and Ernie grabbed a fistful of her hair to pull her face up to his. They came forward to meet in a kiss, playfully passing a piece of Gamble between their mouths. The child's laughter echoed through the asylum as the building collapsed in on itself. The helmet Travis had given him saved Ernie's life. It took a few hours to crawl out of the rubble, but he managed. He walked through the forest hand in hand with Sarah until the last bits of sinew tore and the arm came free from the rest of the torso. It was probably for the better. Whirlwind romances never seemed to last anyhow. He kept the arm, though, for the long drive home. Rigor was setting in, and it would give him one hell of a squeeze. Ernie hadn't just survived the night. He'd been reborn. He had a new understanding of who he was and what he needed to do with his life. You can't wait for the things you want to come to you in life. No, you have to go out and find them yourself. He'd go back to Gamble's home. The books and weapons there were just what he needed. Sarah had been special, if only for one night but she'd shown him what his life was missing. He pulled the revolver from his waistband and smiled. Ernie just needed to find someone to love. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Ain't love grand. Leave it to our good buddy David O'Hanlon to give us a truly nauseating and delightfully disgusting story to start out February because love is in the air. And I want to remind you all that next week, our Valentine's Day story is extra special. It's a novella-length story by our very own Rob Fields. And I assure you, you won't want to miss it. It's going to expand a whole lot on the Strickfield universe and take us to some new heights. And keep an eye on this channel. You might just get an extra sneak peek before the week is out. But that's right, next Wednesday, a very special Valentine's episode. And hopefully, I won't have this uh, augmented bass voice by then, although I'm sure many of you are enjoying it. (laughs) It feels weird hearing it through my headphones, so. Anyway, I'm getting a little loopy. I need to take some more cold medicine and uh, take a little nap. But before I get out of here, I want to say thank you so much for joining the Patreon. It really makes a huge difference in keeping the spooky coming every single week and an extra special thank you to our patreon podcast boosters folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names on the show and they are johnny nix john callen bobbletopia.com jenny green brent mccullough karen we met jack kerr and craig cohen thank you all so much and if you want to hear your name at the end of the show just go to weekly spooky.com click on patreon and select any tier at 15 dollars a month or higher and you'll get to hear your name out of my temporarily sultry voice. But now, my friends, it's time to get out of here. I really do need that nap, but I'm happy I could bring you a little spooky in your weekly before I get to it. So, for myself, for my producer, Dan Wilder, my executive producers, Mark Shields and Rob Fields, and my composer, Ray Mattis, please, my dear, stay spooky and stay healthy. Get some rest. You never know. It's flu season. Watch out. (laughs) Later, my friends. Talk at you soon. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you are safe. Trust me. (laughs) 